It's the weirdest thing. Every now and then the economy just goes south. Workers get laid off, goods lie unsold on the shelves, banks cut interest rates in the hope that people will borrow more money and buy things. If things get really bad, interest rate can be lowered to zero or even below that. It's happened. And nobody's willing to borrow any money anyway. Things get bad. This has been going on for so long, though, it's become something we take for granted. But it does seem odd, doesn't it? Why should the economy just every now and then go bust? Our saga of the business cycle could be said to begin with Jean-Baptiste Say, who lived from 1767 to 1832. He was a French political economist who famously came up with Say's Law of Markets. He believed, that the power, he believed in the power of unobstructed free enterprise. Say's Law of Markets essentially said that when people produce goods, there is a market for them. Producers wouldn't produce things unless they had a gainful way of exchanging them, and so supply tends to create its own demand. Say's Law implies that markets are going to manage themselves, and outside meddling creates more problems than it solves. As Adam Smith famously said, an invisible hand works to arrange economic behavior optimally. Over time, in the aggregate, there aren't going to be piles of unsold goods or gangs of unemployed workers. Except that sometimes there just are. Economic depressions or panics happen regularly during the 19th century. However, the classical political economists continued to believe that markets would always correct themselves. The original Say's Law implied that general overproduction was impossible. If too many goods were produced at one time, Prices would adjust downward and increased demand would soak up any excess. This implied that these panics and depressions were results of intervention, meddling by governments or cartels or monopolies. Classical economists like David Ricardo reasoned that a free market left alone might experience some fluctuations but would be immune to major crises. But major crises kept coming. The Panic of 1837 came after a decade or so of economic expansion, during which the prices of cotton, slaves, and land all rose sharply. Westward expansion was accelerating, and land speculation was big business. Andrew Jackson was suspicious of paper money. It's ironic that he turned up on the $20 bill for all those years. And he was suspicious of central banking. He abolished the Second Bank of the United States, and his administration decided to accept only gold and silver as payment for federal land. Meanwhile, Jackson's policy of forcibly removing many tens of thousands of Native Americans from states across the southern United States opened many new areas to the plantation economy. Things were booming until a recession in Great Britain led to a decline in the price of cotton, the United States' most important export, which reverberated through the economy. Supply of gold and silver coins dried up. The ensuing panic led to a run on the banks in which many people lost their savings. The U.S. economy shrank for seven years. Fast forward to 1873, at which time there was great excitement and optimism about the development of railroads. New territories were being opened to development. Transportation of goods became vastly more economical. There was tremendous demand for Credit of all kinds for development in the West, this created a railroad mania of risky lending, which was similar in many ways to the risky lending practices that recently led to the speculative bubble of the 2000s and the Great Crash of 2008. The Panic of 1873 led to the Long Depression of the 1870s. This bad experience was very familiar to the readers of Henry George's Progress and Poverty, which was first published in 1879 and became a worldwide bestseller. Its subtitle was An Inquiry into the Cause of Industrial Depressions and of Increase of Want with Increase of Wealth. George noted that depressions happen so regularly that they must not be just caused by one thing after another, just a string of societal bad luck. They must have some structural cause. It seemed clear that speculation, buying stuff and holding it until its value increased, was a big part of boom-bust cycles. Each depression had been preceded by binges of speculative investment. Indeed, the depressions were seen as something like a hangover that follows too intense a pursuit of speculative profits, bidding up the price of the latest fad and diverting too many resources to its market. Henry George was focused, as we are, 
on the basic economic difference between land and capital. So he tried separating them in this case. What happens, he asked, when people buy up commodities, items of wealth, and hold them for speculation? Well, when people speculate in pork bellies or emeralds or crude oil, that means the demand for those things is higher. More people are trying to buy them, the price goes up. As the price rises, more of those goods are supplied so the producers can take advantage of the higher prices, and this increase in supply relative to demand brings their prices back down. It's a self-regulating market, the invisible hands at work. We have well-developed institutions for speculating in various kinds of commodities. They're called futures markets, and they serve a valuable economic function. They even out various kinds of market fluctuations, making prices more stable and predictable. This is especially important in farm products, where there are so many variables of the weather that are of unpredictable items. Therefore, speculation in commodities cannot bring about economic depressions. Kind of reminds us of Say's Law. If every market functioned like the market for commodities, we wouldn't have to worry about depressions. But, as you suspect if you've been with me this long, not every market functions that way. When land is held for speculation, no more land can be supplied to meet any greater demand. And when land is held out of use, people who are able and willing to produce wealth on it cannot do so. Remember our last lesson when we explored the chart that added up the missed opportunities when workers are denied access to the best land? Henry George reasoned that land speculation becomes an increasingly attractive investment as productivity increases and the economy grows. So land rent absorbs more and more of society's output until the cost of land gets so high that labor and capital begin to be unable to afford it. Production in one segment of the economy slows down, but this spreads throughout an interconnected, interdependent modern economy. George thought that he had solved the mystery of the boom-bust cycle. His remedy, which we will soon consider in detail, was to collect the rent of land for public revenue, thus allowing the entire community to benefit from increases in land values and cutting out the profit of land speculation. Unfortunately, there was one error in George's business cycle theory, one small hiccup. This error did not invalidate George's proposed remedy, but it did render his theory ineffective as a predictor of future cycles. Henry George's theories were, alas, uncritically revered by his followers and savagely derided by his critics. Therefore, his ideas on the boom-bust cycle were pretty much unexamined, neither validated nor corrected, for many decades, while society continued to flail about in search of an explanation for economic booms and busts. Meanwhile, society moved into the 20th century. And in the 20th century, as we all know, we went big. We had big wars, we had big weapons, and we had huge industrial progress. And we had the greatest boom and bust of economic history. The roaring 1920s saw a new wave of technological advances in transportation and production. Mass-produced automobiles were brand new and got more affordable every year. One part of this technological revolution that was less flashy and less widely remembered today yet had huge impact was the widespread availability and falling cost of tractors and other powered farm equipment. They drastically increased the productivity of farms and lowered food prices across the board. Just as the railroads had done in the 1870s, these developments opened up vast new areas to profitable development. A speculative bubble was blown up to breathtaking size in the 1920s. Everyone remembers the stock market crash. However, there was also a tremendous real estate bubble. Today, we're familiar with the sketchy lending practices that led to the great crash of 2008. Banks were eager to jump on the bandwagon of soaring land values and began offering subprime loans to borrowers who couldn't really afford them. Millions of people could just barely afford their mortgage payments when times were good. Similar practices went on during the 1920s. The term in those days was shoestring mortgages, but the practice was essentially the same. In the 1920s, as in the 2000s, this process was accelerated by the creation of mortgage-backed securities, Mortgages were bought up, bundled together, and marketed as a speculative investment in their own right. Once again, we think of this as a recent invention, but it was going on in the 1920s too. When the bubble burst, which always happens, though speculative investors never expect it, the ensuing crash was gigantic. Something had to be done. 
The Great Depression was horrific. It was the deepest economic bust in history. At its height, more than 20% of the United States' working age population was unemployed. Starting in 1930, the Hoover administration tried to stimulate business by providing low-cost loans to banks, but this fell flat. Nobody was borrowing at any rate of interest. Business wasn't expanding. It was contracting rapidly. There was deflation. Money was actually increasing in value because nobody was spending it. That's the opposite of inflation. In the Great Depression, the government found itself powerless to deal with deflation and with runs on the banks that led to millions of people losing their savings. Changes were put into place to ward off such banking crises in the future. Two important reforms were adopted under the Glass-Steagall Banking Reform Act of 1933. Until then, banks were allowed to engage in both deposit banking and investment banking. Deposit banking is when people have conventional savings and checking accounts. Investment banking is when people buy and hold portfolios of various financial instruments such as stocks, bonds, funds, etc. Under Glass-Steagall, the same firm could not engage in both of these practices. Also, to prevent the huge loss of individual savings that went on in the Great Depression, federal deposit insurance was instituted. After that, up to $100,000 in conventional savings accounts was guaranteed by federal deposit insurance. That's what your bank means when it says it's a member of FDIC. Between 2008 and 2010, the limit was temporarily increased to $250,000. And as for the cause of recessions per se, the influential work of John Maynard Keynes pretty much convinced the capitalist world that boom-bust cycles are an integral part of a modern capitalist economy. Keynes' theory implied that the boom-bust cycle cannot be eliminated, but its worst effects can be mitigated by prudent government action. According to Keynes, a downturn in the business cycle is caused when too many people choose to save their money rather than invest it. In general, money that's saved is simply held for safekeeping. It isn't deployed in the economy to create new goods. Investment entails risk, and savers are risk averse. But if there is too little investment, productive capacity falls, along with the demand for labor, which creates unemployment. In Keynes' view, something must be done to encourage investment, which will kickstart the demand for goods and services. Keynes proposed injecting money into the economy by means of increased government spending, deficit spending if need be, and lowered interest rates. Now, it could be noted that the Keynesian theory doesn't really explain anything. It supposes there is an unwillingness to invest, but doesn't reveal why people are unwilling. Still, it promised a means for government to effectively manage economic downturns before they became debilitatingly severe. We could start talking about recessions instead of depressions, which was better, yet we weren't out of the woods. And in our next section, we'll talk about the process of the boom-bust cycle since the Great Depression and since the institution of Keynesian remedies. Thanks for watching, everybody. Understanding Economics is a presentation of the Henry George School of Social Science with videography by Uladzimur Takachu. In our next session, we try to bring the saga of the boom-bust cycle up to date.